great sack. But um, we're pretty afterwards, you know that? Squirrel wouldn't make me sing a song, would it please, Vic? No way, baby. As a kid coming up, the only people I had to relate to were athletes. And uh, the few people in television were uh, the butlers the, doing the menial jobs and the, the tribesmen in the Tarzan movies. I mean, uh, obviously we got tired. Did you know that one of the most famous lines from the movie Shaft wasn't planned? The line became a huge hit, but it wasn't in the script. Was it a lucky mistake or just perfect timing? As soon as some, someone came out with a film that put another black person in the front, people gonna, black people are going to obviously flock to that. Now, it's, it was very nice being a part of that, but it's even nicer being part of the first television series mm -hmm. on television with a black lead in a serious picture, uh, drama, uh, as opposed to a uh, variety of uh, comedy. comedy type thing. It wasn't just a line, it became part of movie history. Let's dive into this interesting story. Tell me what the f you want with me. Please go be a basket while you threw that son of a f out the window. The movie Shaft is a big deal for many people. The movie has a lot of history, and it's a classic action film that made a huge impact when it first came out in 1971. Before we get into Shaft's most loved lines, it's important to understand what made this film special and how it shaped Hollywood. Uh, John Shaft, uh, he was tough, he was smart, but he was also the hero. And that tough, smart, streetwise, swaggering hero, that was something that, that really hadn't been seen before. And, and it was new and it stayed with us. It introduced uh, a new kind of film. They called it black exploitation for a while. Shaft is all about John Shaft a cool private detective from Harlem. He's tough, smart, and doesn't back down from anyone. The story of Shaft is simple. John Shaft is hired to find a missing woman, but as he digs deeper, he gets tangled up in a world of crime and danger. The movie is packed with action, fight scenes, and lots of suspense. Shaft is not afraid to stand up to the bad guys, and that's part of what makes him so popular. He's the kind of character who does what's right, no matter how tough the situation is. Where the hell are you going, Shaft? To get laid. Where the hell are you going? Black exploitation movies were a big part of the 1970s and helped shape how black characters were shown in films. Shaft is often seen as a pioneer because it introduced a strong black character, John Shaft, who was tough, smart, and operated outside of the normal rules. He was a private detective who fought crime his own way, and people loved him for it. But while Shaft brought a new level of attention to black characters in movies, it also raised some concerns about the kind of images it showed. You're really great, Zach, but um, we're pretty sh afterwards, you know that? John Shaft was portrayed as a ladies' man and someone with an exaggerated, hyper-masculine image. He was the kind of guy who always had control of every situation, and he was always very confident. This was a different image of black men in movies compared to what audiences had seen before. When I was a kid coming up, the only people I had to relate to were athletes. And uh, the few people in television were uh, the butlers the, doing the menial jobs and the, the tribesmen in the Tarzan movies. I mean, uh, obviously we got tired of that. But the problem was that many movies after Shaft started to copy this exaggerated style of black masculinity. While it was exciting to see black characters in strong roles, some of these films just played up these stereotypes rather than breaking them down. Instead of challenging how black men were often seen in society, they ended up reinforcing these stereotypes, which made some people uncomfortable. Where the are you going, Shaft? To get laid, where the are you going? Despite this, Shaft played a big role in starting the black exploitation genre. It wasn't the very first, but it was the first big commercial hit that brought attention to these types of movies. Before Shaft, black actors were often stuck playing roles that weren't very exciting or powerful. But with Shaft, black actors could finally show that they were more than just sidekicks or background characters. As soon as some, someone came out with a film that put another black person in the front, people gonna, black people were gonna obviously flock to that. Now, it's, it was very nice being a part of that, but it's even nicer being part of the first television series mm -hmm. on television with a black lead in a serious picture, uh, drama, uh, as opposed to a uh, variety of uh, comedy. comedy type thing. The movie helped pave the way for more black-led films, 
not just in the 1970s, but even into the 1980s and beyond. Squirrel wouldn't make me sing a song, would it please, Vic? No way, baby. One thing that made Shaft stand out was how it made black actors seem cool and in control. When Shaft came out, it was unlike any movie black actors had been in before. Uh, African-American characters had been stereotyped earlier as, uh, as, as criminal or as stupid or as lazy. And then we got the very sort of pious African-American character, like the Cindy Poitier characters, uh, who didn't have a blemish on them. But Shaft was something different. People loved the idea of seeing a black man who wasn't afraid to break the rules and stand up for what he believed in. This idea of a tough, confident black hero became a big part of the black exploitation movement, and we still see it today in films like Black Dynamite and Undercover Brother. The film's story focuses on Shaft trying to take down the Italian mafia. While the mafia was a dangerous and powerful group, this choice as the main villain has been seen by some as a way of avoiding the real, deep issues of racism and inequality in American society. The mafia, as portrayed in the film, is a criminal organization that operates outside the law, but it's not tied to the everyday struggles that many black Americans face in their daily lives, like unfair treatment by police, lack of opportunities, and discrimination in housing, education, and jobs. Many people believe Shaft could have been a chance to tackle those tough issues head on. Instead of showing the main character battling against an unjust system or addressing the problems of race in America, the film chose to focus on a different kind of conflict, one that would be less controversial for mainstream audiences. Some feel that by doing this, the filmmakers missed an important opportunity to spark a conversation about racism. At the same time, Shaft didn't ignore race altogether. However, the film didn't go as far as it could have in directly challenging the systemic racism that existed in America. Something that many people were dealing with every day fast forward to 2019, and a new Shaft movie hit theaters. This time, Samuel L. Jackson returned as John Shaft, a role he had played before in a 2000 version. The 2019 film also introduced a younger Shaft, John Shaft Jr., played by Jesse T. Usher, who is trying to learn about his family's tough legacy. The movie shows the clash between the older generation's traditional style and today's newer ideas. You the one bringing up her being a woman is I don't give a about the agenda. Okay. I'm an equal opportunity woman. However, the latest version of Shaft didn't sit well with everyone. Many movie critics felt it was offensive. They called it racist, sexist, and homophobic. In other words, they felt it had too much outdated and negative humor, especially about women and LGBTQ people. One critic from The Guardian said that Shaft tried too hard to be macho in a way that doesn't fit today's world. They thought it showed too much toxic masculinity, meaning a type of manliness that is overly aggressive, disrespectful to women, and closed-minded. No non-violent people in Harlem? Junior. Uh, she's strong. Another critic, Katie Walsh, agreed. She said that some of the jokes in the movie, especially the ones aimed at younger, more woke people, were too mean-spirited. She also felt that Jackson's Shaft character pushed old-fashioned ideas of manhood that seemed out of place and offensive today. This included treating women as objects and making jokes that seemed hostile toward LGBTQ people. Critics from the Austin Chronicle and Arizona Republic had similar complaints. They didn't like how Shaft's character is politically incorrect without any shame. In other words, Shaft says and does things that might have been more accepted in the past but are now considered offensive by today's standards. Some critics tried to see it as a fun, nostalgic look at an old school hero, but they still felt the humor was outdated and offensive. Interestingly, Kenya Barris, one of the writers behind the 2019 Shaft, is known for his socially conscious TV show, Blackish. This show often tackles important social issues with humor and sensitivity. Yet even with his involvement, the movie still faced backlash from critics. This shows how difficult it can be to bring an old character like Shaft into the modern world without clashing with today's values and standards. The new Shaft aimed to honor the classic character while adding a new twist, but it left critics divided. Some saw it as a missed opportunity to make Shaft more relatable to today's audiences without losing his strong identity. Others thought it was just too outdated and offensive, 
unable to adapt Shaft's classic style to today's expectations. Where the hell you going, Shaft? To get laid, where the hell you going? Over the years, many lines from Shaft have become classics. Let's talk about some of the most memorable ones in simple, easy to understand language. These quotes show Shaft's style, sense of humor, and strong sense of justice. One line fans love is when Alter Wade Jr. says, look, the guy couldn't take a joke. And Shaft responds, so you cracked his head off, I can dig it. Shaft's response is short, but it says a lot. He also isn't letting anyone off the hook, and he's not afraid to call people out, even with humor. Then there's the scene where Shaft grills someone who threatened a waitress. He asks, the waitress, she saw it all, didn't she? So what did you do, MF? Threaten her? Shaft's blunt questions show he's serious about protecting people. Another classic line comes up in a lighter funny scene where Shaft says, you wouldn't know Egyptian cotton if the Pharaoh himself sent it to you. Shaft is making fun of the guy for acting like he's classy, but he really doesn't know anything about fine things. One fan favorite line that gets a lot of laughs is when Peoples Hernandez says to Walter Wade, you're an interesting mother beeper. You got like a business card or something? Peoples delivery here is funny because he's a gangster and seeing a tough guy talk about business cards is unexpected. Shaft also has lines that show he isn't easily intimidated. For example, he once says, I'm gonna put so many lawyers up your you're gonna think they opened a franchise there. This line is funny, but also strong. Another powerful moment is when Shaft says, how about no bail? Back off, son, back off, son. Shaft doesn't let anyone push him around. When he says no bail, he's basically saying, you're not going anywhere. Did you know that the famous character Shaft was created by a white newspaper reporter? John Shaft first appeared in a book by Ernest Tidyman, a writer who once worked for big newspapers like the Cleveland News, the New York Post, and the New York Times. After years as a reporter, Tidyman decided to try something different and wrote seven detective stories about Shaft. The character became so popular that Tidyman turned the first book into a movie script with the help of writer John D.F. Black. Tidyman's work didn't stop there. He went on to write famous movies like The French Connection and High Plains Drifter. His efforts were recognized when he won an NACP Image Award. I mean, I can no longer walk around Central Park or walk down uh, 42nd Street like I used to. It's just a whole different ball game now. Um, now I'm relegated to spending my weekends in Victorville, California, in the desert riding horses just to get away from it. Shooting the movie Shaft in New York City wasn't a sure thing. The studio MGM wanted to film it in Los Angeles to save money, but director Gordon Parks believed that New York's unique feel was essential. Just hours before filming began, the studio tried to call Parks back to LA. Determined, he flew to LA and told the executives he would quit if he couldn't shoot in New York. Parks argued, it has to have the smell of New York. The studio finally agreed, and the film got its real New York vibe. One last thing almost changed Shaft's look, his mustache. The producer, Joel Freeman, told actor Richard Roundtree to shave it off. When Parks saw Roundtree about to do it, he quickly intervened. Shave it off and you're out of a job, he told Roundtree. And so the mustache stayed, becoming a key part of Shaft's iconic look. Gordon Parks at age 88 has had a prolific career as a world famous photographer for Life Magazine, as a best-selling novelist, as the first black director of a Hollywood studio film, and as a composer and poet and pianist. Gordon Parks, a legendary photographer and filmmaker, made sure his influence was seen in every part of the movie Shaft including the magazines on the newsstand. In the movie's opening, when Shaft stops by a newsstand to chat with a blind vendor, the magazine Essence is front and center. This was no coincidence. Parks helped create Essence and was its editorial director for the first three years. He is most famous for his poignant pictures of racism and poverty and in film for directing the 1970s classic Shaft. Parks also made a small appearance in the movie. He shows up as a landlord smoking a pipe who complains about Ben Buford, a character in the movie who owes him six months of rent. This quick cameo added a fun touch to the film. Another interesting part of Shaft is Bumpy Jonas, the crime boss character. Bumpy was based on a real person, Ellsworth Bumpy Johnson, a powerful Harlem mobster. From the 1930s to the 1960s, Bumpy controlled much of Harlem's crime scene. 
He was involved in big crimes, like the murder of the gangster Dutch Schultz, and he mentored Frank Lucas, a heroin dealer who inspired the movie American Gangster. You gonna shoot me in front of everybody? Huh? Come on. Bumpy's life has inspired many Hollywood films, like The Cotton Club and Hoodlum. My pants are <laughs> Drew Bundini Brown, who worked with Muhammad Ali, also appears in Shaft. Known for his famous phrase, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee, Brown was Ali's assistant trainer. In Shaft, he plays one of Bumpy Jonas's men, showing that even Ali's circle was part of the film world. In the movie, you might have noticed a company called Sklut Insurance next to Shaft's office. This isn't a random name. It's actually a little shout out to a real person who worked on the movie. The production team decided to name the insurance company after Stephen P. Sklut, who was the unit production manager for the film. This kind of hidden reference, or nod, is pretty common in movies, and it's a fun way for filmmakers to leave a mark or say thank you to crew members who worked hard behind the scenes. There's another fun story about director Gordon Parks. When he went to London to promote Shaft, he faced an interesting question from a British reporter. The reporter asked what Shaft meant. Instead of explaining, Parks just lifted his middle finger, a universal sign that got his point across. Then the reporter asked why the characters in the movie kept calling each other mother. Parks didn't really have an answer, but a quick thinking woman in the audience spoke up, explaining it in a humorous way. You know Smucker's jam? Just take off the first two letters and add an F, and you'll understand. Her funny response helped everyone in the room get the joke. The film's music, especially the theme from Shaft by Isaac Hayes, is famous too. Hayes' song won an Oscar for Best Original Song in 1972. This was a big deal because he was the first black composer to win this award. Hayes had actually wanted to play the lead role of Shaft, but didn't get the part. Still, his theme song became iconic, and his Oscar win was a historic moment in Hollywood. In the first two Shaft movies, Shaft teams up with a powerful mob boss named Bumpy Jonas to get things done. Now, Bumpy isn't just any fictional character. He's based on a real gangster who controlled the streets of Harlem. This man was named Ellsworth Bumpy Johnson, and he was one of the most well-known criminals in Harlem from the 1930s to the 1960s. Bumpy was feared and respected in his community. Most people today know about him thanks to the movie American Gangster, where he's portrayed as a mentor to Frank Lucas and another big name criminal. In American Gangster, Denzel Washington plays Frank Lucas, who learns the ropes from Bumpy and later becomes a major kingpin himself. You gonna shoot me in front of everybody? Huh? Come on. This connection adds a layer of realism to the Shaft series. Instead of just a made up villain, Bumpy Jonas is based on a person who really existed, making the story feel even grittier and more intense. The Shaft movies are usually gritty, focusing on crime and action in New York City. But by the third movie, Shaft in Africa, the story takes a wild turn. This time, Shaft goes all the way to Africa to stop a modern-day slave ring. The movie shifts its style and tone, taking on an adventurous vibe, almost like a James Bond film, complete with fancy gadgets, different locations, and even some romance. In Shaft in Africa, Shaft has to blend in with an African tribe to complete his mission, which includes him pretending to be interested in women from the tribe as a part of his cover. While the movie is entertaining, it feels very different from the earlier, more serious films. Fans of Shaft weren't too happy with this change, and the movie isn't talked about much today. Some people even feel it took away from the strong themes and message of the original Shaft movies. He became a superstar in a couple of short years, now he's on television, and now he's on Omelette, as a matter of fact. After making a name for himself in movies, Shaft moved to television in 1973. The show starred Richard Roundtree, who played Shaft in the films, and it brought the character to a wider audience. But there was a big change in this version of Shaft. Instead of working against the police, he was now working with them. Many fans thought this went against Shaft's rebellious character. After all, Shaft was known for his independent attitude and his distrust of authority. And as soon as some, someone came out with a film that put another black person in the front, people gonna, black people are going to obviously flock to that. Now, 
It's, it was very nice being a part of that, but it's even nicer being part of the first television series on television with a black lead in a serious picture, uh, drama, uh, as opposed to a uh, variety of uh, comedy. comedy type thing. Unfortunately, the TV show didn't last long. It aired for only seven episodes before it was canceled. One reason was that another similar show, Hawkins, came out at the same time and ended up competing for viewers. Roundtree wasn't happy with how the TV series turned out, and he has since distanced himself from it, saying he didn't like the direction it took with Shaft. The Shaft franchise got a reboot in 2000, with Samuel L. Jackson stepping into the role. Director John Singleton had big dreams for the franchise and wanted to make it into a series of movies. One idea was to take Shaft to Jamaica, where he'd fight against drug lords. This idea was similar to Shaft in Africa, where Shaft goes outside of New York and takes on criminals in a new setting. But the 2000 Shaft movie didn't perform as well as hoped. The box office numbers weren't great, and Jackson himself wasn't too thrilled with how it turned out. Because of this, plans for a sequel were dropped. The franchise stayed quiet for years until the latest revival came out in 2019. Also in Django Unchained, Django's wife Broomhilda is a brave and beautiful woman who is separated from her husband and forced into slavery. Django, played by Jamie Foxx, partners with a bounty hunter, Dr. King Schultz, to track her down and set her free. The movie is set in the pre-Civil War South and has a mix of action, drama, and humor, all typical of Tarantino's style. Broomhilda's last name, Fawn Shaft, might just sound like a random choice, but it has a deeper meaning. Tarantino has suggested that Broomhilda could be the ancestor of John Shaft, the lead character in the Shaft movies, who is an African-American private investigator fighting crime in New York City. Tarantino even once said in an interview that he sees Broomhilda as the first Shaft, meaning she would be the start of a powerful, fearless family line that eventually leads to John Shaft himself. The original Shaft movie came out in 1971, and it became an instant hit. People loved the character so much that the Shaft series continued with sequels and even a 2000 reboot starring Samuel L. Jackson as a younger Shaft. In the 2000 version, Jackson plays the nephew of the original Shaft. But in the 2019 Shaft sequel, the story changes slightly. In this version, Jackson's character says he's actually the son of the original Shaft. This small adjustment was made to simplify the story, as the previous nephew setup was a bit confusing. So if we think of Broomhilda as the first in the Shaft family line, it would mean that her courage and resilience passed down through generations, eventually leading to the strong-willed John Shaft we see in the 1970s, movies and beyond. There's an interesting myth about the Shaft character that has floated around for years. Some people believe that Shaft was originally meant to be a white character. This idea came from filmmaker Melvin Van Peebles, who said MGM was planning to cast a white actor as Shaft. However, after Van Peebles' film Sweet Sweetback's Badass's song became a success, the studio decided to keep Shaft as a black character, seeing the potential for success with a black lead in a black exploitation film. Critics have argued that Van Peebles might have exaggerated the situation and that Shaft was always meant to be black. Either way, the myth shows how much influence black exploitation films had in bringing black heroes into the spotlight, creating new and exciting roles for African-American actors. Innkeeper! Two beers for two weary travelers. Even though Django Unchained and Shaft seem like completely different movies, Tarantino's hint about Broomhilda's last name gives a fun way to connect the two stories. By suggesting that Broomhilda could be the ancestor of John Shaft, Tarantino invites us to imagine a bigger family story. It's as if Django Unchained could be a secret prequel to Shaft, showing how this powerful bloodline of strong, determined characters began long before the 1970s. This possible link between Django Unchained and Shaft adds more depth to both stories. It gives Django and Broomhilda fight for freedom even more meaning, knowing they might have descendants who would carry on their strength and courage in new ways. It also brings a fun twist for fans of both movies, allowing them to see a shared world where these characters' stories blend together.